This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, a very warm welcome to you all. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Michael McGregor, and I'm the Robert Wolf Director of the Words with Trust in Grasmere. And I'd like to start by saying how grateful we are to the Institute of English Studies and the University of London uh, for this very important partnership that we've fostered uh, now into its fourth year. This is the fourth of our annual Words with Lectures. And uh, speaking to Professor Warwick Gould, uh, who's been a prime mover in developing this partnership, he pointed out uh, that it, the relationship with the Wizard Trust is a perfect fit for the university and the way in which it can facilitate scholarship um, across the country and working with organisations like ourselves. And we're extremely grateful to Warwick and also to John Millington, who's done so much to organise uh, tonight's event. It's important that the Words with Trust has the opportunity to come down to London from time to time and say hello, uh, partly because we've got so many good friends here in the capital and I'm delighted to see so many uh, familiar faces here this evening uh, and also delighted to see some new faces as well because it gives us the opportunity um, to say hello, uh, we are the Words with Trust and uh, there are staff and trustees here this evening who will be delighted to tell you a lot more about the important work that we do. Uh, we are based in Grasmere but our work really spreads across the country and internationally as well as a centre for scholarship in Wordsworth specifically but also the, the writers and artists of the entire Romantic period uh, is very much our brief as is the poetry of today and we have a thriving contemporary literature programme as well. I appreciate the support that many of you give us in this room tonight. Um, I've been saying for I think for the past three years now that uh, as an organisation we're living in challenging times. I think that's become a bit of an overused phrase now but um, it is very challenging for us uh, as it is for many organisations out there and the support that we get from our friends from our patrons and from those who support us in other ways is absolutely invaluable. So on behalf of the trustees and staff of the Words of the Trust, I just wanted to take this opportunity to say a big and very heartfelt thank you uh, to you all. And now gives me the very greatest pleasure to introduce our speaker for this evening. This is the fourth of the uh, Words of the Trust. And our speaker this evening is Dr. Seamus Perry. Uh, Seamus is a fellow and tutor at Balliol College, Oxford, and a lecturer at the University in English. He's also a fellow of the English Association and, since 2002, uh, a trustee of the Wordsworth Trust. Seamus's research interests embrace English dramatic poetry and thought, uh, especially Coleridge and Wordsworth, uh, and in post-romantic English poetry, he has a particular interest in Tennyson, Borden, Eliot, Larkin and their circles. Uh, Seamus has published widely on the Romantic poets, including a selection from Coleridge's notebooks for OUP and a biography of Coleridge for the British Library's Writers' Lives series. He's edited with Christopher Ricks of the journal Essays and Criticism and general editor of the 21st Century Oxford Authors series. Seamus's lecture this evening uh, bears the intriguing title, What Did Wordsworth Make of Coleridge? Um, I feel we could easily devote probably the next decade of words with lectures to that particular subject. We're only going to give Seamus about an hour, but ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Seamus Perry. Here is a report from one of the poets' circle of meeting Wordsworth at Rital Mount in 1834, a few days after, that's the portraits of the two poets I'm talking about, a few days after Coleridge had died. <coughs> My brother and I walked over to the Mount, the speaker of someone called the Reverend Graves, walked over to the Mount where we found the poet alone. One of the first things we heard from him was the death of one who had been, he said, his friend for more than 30 years then continued to speak of him, called him the most wonderful man. I take it the italics are somehow an impression of Wordsworth's own emphasis. 
that he had ever known. Wonderful was the originality of his mind and the power he possessed of throwing out in profusion grand central truths from which might be evolved the most comprehensive systems. Well, that was very heartfelt and expressed in the moment of um, grief. But Wordsworth's terms were uh, unusual for him. Here, from the other end of uh, Coleridge's life, is Hazlitt, uh, Hazlitt writing later in life, but recalling the early happy days of his acquaintance with poets who he knew. Uh, Hazlitt's talking about uh, Coleridge's extraordinary charisma and says this, I can easily credit the accounts which are circulated of his holding forth to a large party of ladies and gentlemen an evening or two before on the Barclian theory when he made the whole material universe look like a transparency of fine words. And another story, which I believe he somewhere told himself, I've never tracked it down, of his being asked to a party of, at Birmingham of his smoking tobacco and going to sleep after dinner on a sofa where the company found him to their no small surprise which was increased to wonder when he started up of a sudden and rubbing his eyes looked about him and launched into a three hours description of the third heaven of which he had just had a dream. So this is clearly a sort of slightly bastardized version of the preface to Kubla Khan, but it's, 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 it's including that, that phrase wonder, which is clearly uh, one of the words that, that hangs around uh, uh, Coleridge's uh, neck. Uh, has a little bit later in that same essay has a nice passage about a man called John Chester who is one of many people who, in the course of a life that was actually full of admirers, although Coleridge thought of himself as being friendless, he endlessly had admirers and friends, and John Chester was one of them, went to Germany with him in the 1798-99 uh, tour, and, uh, and hung around him and, and, and hung on his every word, and Hazlitt is um, uh, suitably contemptuous of John Chester because he didn't have quite the uh, genius that Hazlitt himself would have had in the same uh, situation, and this is what has this about Chester. This Chester was a native of Nether Stowey, one of those who were attracted to Goldridge's discourse as flies are to honey, or bees in swarming time to the sound of a brass pan. He had on a brown cloth coat, boots, and corduroy breeches, was low in stature, bow legged had a drag in his walk like a drover, which he assisted by a hazel switch, and kept on a sort of trot by the side of Coleridge, like a running footman by a state coach, that he might not lose a syllable or sound that fell from Coleridge's lips. He told me his private opinion that Coleridge was a wonderful man. Well, has this rather snooty joke, of course, is that everyone thought that Coleridge was a wonderful man, so that for Chester to have formed this view, as it were, in the privacy of his own inadequate brain, was a sign of uh, just how lackluster he was, I suppose, compared to Hazlitt himself, who I think more than anything else wanted Coleridge to love him, uh, and of course never had that pleasure. Um, uh, Chester wasn't very hardened to life, he was an ingenuous person, uh, but people much, much more hardened and much less ingenuous than John Chester could be taken in, not dissimilarly, by the same Coleridge wonder effect. Uh, uh, there are a few people in the Romantic period less uh, unhardened than Byron, uh, and Byron, uh, uh, or indeed less dis disposed to uh, heroize the late poets, uh, and Byron uh, fell under the sway uh, as well. This is what Lee Hunt says about Byron leaving, uh, about, about Coleridge leaving Byron's house. I think this must have happened somewhere in 1815 or possibly early 1816. Hunt recalls. He recited his Kubla Khan one morning to Lord Byron in his lordship's house in Piccadilly when I happened to be in another room. I remember the others, that's to say Byron's, coming away from him highly struck with his poem and saying how wonderfully he talked. How wonderfully he talked. This is the impression of everybody who hears him. Uh, and of course shortly after that it's Byron who persuades Murray that he has to publish Kubla Khan and indeed persuades Coleridge that he has to publish Kubla Khan. Uh, in that little slim volume of 1816 along with Christabel uh, and the Pains of Sleep, a volume which has such a, considering its uh, slightness as a volume, has such an extraordinarily disproportionate influence on the second generation of the English Romantics. So lots and lots of people associate Coleridge with his wonderfulness and his wonder, and especially the wonder of his talk, but also the wonder of the things that he's saying uh, when he's talking. Uh, and if we're thinking about Wordsworth and Coleridge, it's uh, striking that that word, wonder, wonderful, wonderfulness, 
uh, goes back all the way to the very, very beginning, really, of the partnership between Coleridge and Wordsworth. Uh, they've known each other since 1795, but the partnership only really gets going in a substantial way in the summer of 1797. Uh, Coleridge, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, has decided to go down to Dorset, to race down where the Wordsworths are living, to visit them. Um, they've been familiar in a kind of radical political way before, but it seems as though the full wonderful influence of Coleridge doesn't really get to work on Wordsworth, on either Wordsworth, but especially on William Wordsworth, for my purposes today, until this encounter in June 1797. It's Dorothy that records the impact of Coleridge's visit in a wonderful and excited letter to Catherine Clarkson, but I'm sure that uh, Dorothy's letter is recording what is a shared impression of their, uh, of their new uh, serious friend. You had a great loss in not seeing Coleridge, writes uh, Dorothy. He is a wonderful man. His conversation teems with soul, mind, and spirit. Then he is so benevolent, so good-tempered and cheerful, and like William, which is to say, you know, like Superman, <laughs> um, interests himself so much about every little trifle. At first, I thought him very plain, that is, for about three minutes. <laughs> he is pale, thin, has a wide mouth, thick lips, and not very good teeth, longish, loose-growing, half-curling, rough black hair, I always think at that point it sounds a bit like Frankenstein's creature. But if you hear him speak for five minutes, you think no more of them. His eye is large and full, and not very dark, but grey. Such an eye as it would receive from a heavy soul, the dullest expression. And of course, in later life, she would talk about Coleridge's eyes being dull when he's in particular fits of dejection. But it speaks every emotion of his animated mind. It has more of the poet's eye in a fine, frenzy, rolling, as you will recognize this Theseus and Midsummer Night's Dream, that I ever witnessed. He has fine, dark eyebrows and an overhanging forehead. And I suppose he's talking about this person. This is Hancock, 1786. Um, I don't know if that, that, that tallies with the description uh, for, for you. That's the closest portrait that I could find. <coughs> so, Coleridge is a wonder. That's where I'm starting from this afternoon. Coleridge is a wonder. But there are interesting ambiguities in the word wonder. Uh, and, uh, and Peter Swart, who's here somewhere, so I'm coming, has just published an extremely interesting article on exactly this, which chimed in really interesting ways with, with what I was thinking in preparation for this lecture. Wonder uh, is, is, a, is a, a word of a very uh, fruitful and interesting ambiguity. And what Peter does in his very interesting uh, essay published in the Journal of Romanticism, is to think about wonder as what the great uh, critic William Emerson called a complex word. And what a complex word often does is to contain within itself some sort of structure of, 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 of discordant or dissonant opinions or views about the, um, about the thing that is the subject of the word uh, and the, the, the topics that uh, Emerson talks about. The words that Emerson talks about are complex words, words like sense or wit things like that, but Peter makes an extremely powerful and I think entirely persuasive case that wonder is, is one, of those, one of those words as well. And I think that feels intuitively right uh, to us, uh, even if you don't want to bring on board the, uh, the whole brilliant Emsonian uh, machinery. There is, even in modern English, um, a kind of shaping or informing ambivalence to our use of the word wonder. Uh, and so where does a uh, a sad middle-aged man go if he wants to uh, give you an example of contemporary use. Well, of course, the answer is Bob Dylan. So here we are. Uh, Bob Dylan has a song with Lovesick on his album uh, called. Um, what is the album where Lovesick appears? I've forgotten. It's coming up on the next slide. Uh, and Bob Dylan sings, "Could you ever be true? I think of you, and there's a wonderful gap in the music, and then he sings, and I wonder." Uh, time out of mind. That's the now, that's a brilliant use of the ambiguities of the word wonder, which persists through to this day, but persisted back certainly to the late 18th century, and I'm sure beyond then. What Dylan is saying in those lines are sort of two things at once, isn't he? What he's saying is, uh, 
once more positively, he's saying, I'm struck by wonder at what you're like. You're marvelous. You're almost too good to be true. That's, as it were, the positive love-struck way of interpreting those lines. But at the same time, he's also saying something else a bit more skeptical, isn't he? He's also saying something like, my idea of you just must be too good to be true. Um, I contemplate you sometimes, and I wonder what you're really all about. I wonder what I'm doing, really. Uh, I wonder, in that sense. So wonder can be at once uh, struck by amazement, but also struck by a kind of accompanying skepticism. And the two feelings have to coexist for the word to be a complex word, or for the word to have that full kind of ambivalence that I want to try and explore a little bit this evening. It's not that the one undercuts the other, uh, it's that the two sort of coexist. Um, this is common to lots of our uh, most uh, uh, popular uh, terms of praise. Uh, uh, my colleague and friend David Wolsey has written about Pope in these terms. It's very interesting the way that Pope singles out words like, um, or, or phrases or ideas like brilliant or dazzling, which are at once extremely positive things to say, but could also with a slight twist be rather negative things to say about someone. It's interesting that our terms of admiration are quite so close to our terms of disparagement. And of course Pope is very, very good because he's very good at talking out of the side of his mouth on, on making um, a full advantage, full marvelous advantage of those kinds of, of duplicities that the terms of praise like wonder can have. I think it's a very interesting phenomenon altogether, and I could talk about it all night, but I'm not going to do that all night, don't worry. Uh, I just think that there's an interesting sort of double play, which is at once being impressed and wrapped by something, but also at the same time um, reserving some sort of hesitancy or some sort of self-defensive skepticism about something uh, that, is, that is important. And I think that's absolutely all in play when Wordsworth talks about Coleridge's wonder. Because I think that that mixture of deep admiration, deep struck, rapt uh, uh, admiration, but at the same time some saving hesitancy or some saving skepticism about what it is that you are being impressed by is exactly uh, the, uh, the truth of what Wordsworth uh, made of Coleridge. <coughs> anyway, let's go back to the June uh, that period of June 1797. What was it about Coleridge in June 1797 that so struck Wordsworth as a source of wonder? Uh, and here immediately one must say that we have a problem, which is that the wonder was communicated chiefly through conversation and not through correspondence. They were living in each other's pockets. They were talking to each other, I suspect mostly was Coleridge talking and Wordsworth listening. Uh, but that means that there must be some sort of degree of speculation about what on earth it was that was going on. There are no letters that I can point you to that say what it was that Coleridge was communicating to Wordsworth in the second half of 1797. So I'm being a little bit speculative, but I don't think that uh, that speculative. But it seems to me that one of the things that stirred Wordsworth very strongly in uh, the things that Coleridge was thinking when he turned up in, in 1797 was uh, and this risks putting it in a very sort of simplistic way, but I, I, I want to just run with it for a little while. I think what he was impressed by was this very powerful sense Coleridge communicated that uh, he was able to see through things. He was able to see that things sort of made sense. And I think that in uh, June 1797, uh, that's exactly what Wordsworth needed. He was in, in the midst of a period of tremendous post-revolutionary turmoil uh, and anxiety, and I think someone turning up in his life who sort of gave you the impression that he had a kind of imaginative and spiritual and perhaps even theological purchase upon what seemed to be otherwise a series of chaotic and, and, and un unmeaningful events. That was just what Wordsworth needed. So Coleridge's wonder, I think, was that he seemed to be a man who brought with him a sense that the world had sense. If you want a comparison to that, it's exactly, it seems to me, or more or less exactly like Auden was to his generation in the 1930s. All Auden's contemporaries and younger, uh, uh, Auden's peers and younger contemporaries in the 30s uh, looked at Auden and saw someone who somehow had a kind of uh, a sense of order uh, about what was going on in the uh, maelstrom of 1930s politics and culture. What Auden himself once called, talking about Thomas Hardy, the hawk's eyes 
artificial. This idea that somehow you were above it and somehow could see through all the, all the, all the chaos into some sort of deep and ordinary structure that was going on underneath. Now for Orton, that was totally different. That, that the basis of that order that, that he uh, pretended to understand was a sort of strange mixture of Marx and Freud and all sorts of things. And for Coleridge, of course, it's totally different. For Coleridge, it's religion. Uh, and there's a very peculiar and interesting religion, a religion that doesn't really feature in, in, in modern life at all. It's, it's a very striking and interesting um, 18th century, especially later 18th century, um, religious experience, which combines, on the one hand, um, mystical, uh, uh, mystical experience or an appeal to source of mysticism, uh, and at the same time, a rather kind of robust and strong-headed kind of enlightenment rationalism. Those two things happen to exist at the same time in quite a lot of uh, dissenting, non-conformist, uh, Protestant Christianity uh, towards the end of the 18th century. And Coleridge's Unitarianism absolutely embodies, uh, to, uh, uh, to a stark degree, that really interesting and perplexing and in some ways rather uh, oxymoronic uh, combination of mysticism and uh, kind of enlightenment um, uh, order. Um, I say that uh, Unitarianism generally um, uh, embodied that, but Coleridge, I think, embodied it even more extremely than most. Uh, in Coleridge, you had a complete commitment to the scientific rationalism of Joseph Priestley, and you also had a complete commitment to the most visionary flights of Plato, and somehow, and Neoplatonism, and somehow those two things joined together inside the one mind gave you, as it were, a toehold in all the Enlightenment values of the 18th century, but also gave you a toehold in all the excitements of, uh, of, of uh, platonic uh, vision. Uh, so a very, very exciting kind of person to meet if, like Wordsworth, you were in the doldrums and looking for an, a new kind of inspiration and a new sort of source of hope. Where this all went to in Coleridge's own poetry were, were lines like this which I don't claim are great poetry, but I think are probably quite striking uh, rhetoric. For what is freedom but the unfettered use of all the powers which God for use hath given? But chiefly this, him first, him last, to view through meaner powers and secondary things effulgent as through clouds that veil his blaze. For all that meets the bodily sense I deem symbolical, one mighty alphabet for infant mind. And we, in this low world, place with our backs the bright reality that we may learn with young, unwounded Ken the substance from its shadow. Now, I'm not claiming that um, Coleridge spoke like that at the breakfast table, but then again, I think he might almost have spoken like that at the breakfast table. And although Wordsworth's instincts were always much less godly than Coleridge, Coleridge himself says that Wordsworth is at least a semi-atheist, which is a wonderful phrase, but it is to be a semi-atheist. Um, nevertheless, Coleridge's big idea in lines like this, and I'm sure in his conversation too, as it was uh, taking place over the breakfast table in Racetown, was, was what? What was the basic idea? What was the big idea that he was bringing into that household? Well, the big idea, I suppose, was, if you had to if you have to paraphrase it, that a devout experience of natural beauty might somehow constitute a revelatory experience, not just a pleasurable experience, not just an aesthetic experience, but in some senses a revelatory experience. It could reveal to you something which is greater or truer or bigger or more meaningful. All those things that Coleridge called God, Wordsworth wasn't so keen on calling it God, but still needed to, to think of it as, as being something other than bigger than and behind the appearances of uh, contemporary uh, life or contemporary uh, uh, nature in the 1790s, which was so inflicted and fraught. And that, I think, is the basic thing that Wordsworth caught on to with great enthusiasm. He thought he'd found it in Godwin, and he hadn't found it in Godwin, and then Coleridge turned up, and he thought again, but much more recently, that he found it in Coleridge. That Coleridge should sit at your table or talk to you while you're out walking over the hills and uh, talk as though he held the keys that would unlock the meaning of the universe, that was just wonderful. And wonder 
in that sense, I'm saying, is wonder in both the ways that I started off by describing. Because it's a marvel, it's an extraordinary thing, but also something that, that might call, and increasingly did call, as I shall be saying towards the end, for a kind of skepticism or a kind of, a kind of wariness. Um, anyway, one striking effect that Coleridge had on Wordsworth following that arrival at Race Down in June 1797 was more or less to silence him. This is often the effect that Coleridge had on people he talked to, or should be said. Uh, the best stories for this, if you want to go look them up, are always uh, Charles Lamb's stories. It's Charles Lamb who tells you stories about Coleridge calling him in behind a hedge on the way to work and holding him by his buttonhole. Charles Lamb being so desperately late for work, he just slips off the buttonhole and disappears <laughs> into your house. And uh, you see the end of the story coming already. Six hours later, he pops back, and the is still there, <laughs> holding the button and chatting away uh, as though Charles Lamb was never gone. Um, Lamb's stories clearly are exaggerated, but they can't be that much exaggerated because there are so many other, uh, so many other testimonies that seem to imply something very similar. My favourite one is. Uh, contemporary who recalled one of Coleridge's neighbours, a um, non-literary intelligentsia, neighbours uh, in Nether Stowey when he's living there, and the neighbour is reported to say, his conversation is always working, working on, and most fatiguing to listen to. <laughs> that's, what, that's what people of Nether Stowey said. His conversation was like, well it was all, you know, like most things that are ingenuous, it wasn't entirely without its wisdom. Uh, Conversations, uh, Coleridge's conversation always was working, working on the person that it was working and working on most emphatically in that uh, late year of seven, that, that second half of 1797 was, of course, Wordsworth. And the extraordinary effect seems to have been to stop him writing poems altogether. Uh, all Wordsworthians have as their sacred text two volumes by uh, an astonishing American scholar called Mark L. Reed called. The chronology, the chronology of the early years and the chronology of the later years, and uh, Mark L. Reed goes through day by day by day, really, Wordsworth's life and what he did and what he wrote. And if you look at the second half of 1797 in the Mark L. Reed chronology, you see he wrote almost nothing. The one thing he might have done is tinkered with the borderers, his, his uh, sort of uh, vaguely Shakespearean tragedy, which he submits to Covent Garden at the end of the year when he gets rejected very quickly. Uh, but that might be the one piece of, of, of writing that he's doing. So he's reduced to silence. And it's important, it seems to me, to, to, to tweak that this silence isn't just that he feels incapable. The silence is the result of trying to collaborate with Coleridge and failing to do so. That's the important thing. It's not just that he thinks, I'm going to have some time away from my own poems. The silence is actually from trying to collaborate with Coleridge and failing to do so. Their principal attempt at collaboration was a supernatural ballad, which they were going to write notionally to raise money, but you know, serious artists never do things just to raise money. They also do things because they want to do them too. Uh, and this, uh, this failed. Um, he told his friend Isabella Fennick years later in life, as we endeavor to proceed conjointly, I speak of the same evening, it's the same evening in which the plan for this ballad was, the ballad becomes the ancient mariner. I should anticipate what I'm saying. As we endeavour to proceed conjointly, I speak of the same evening on which the whole plan was conceived, our respective manners proved so widely different that it would have been quite presumptuous in me to do anything but separate from the undertaking on which I could only have been clogged. Now, that's years and years later. But in the emphasis of that word clog, it seems to be this kind of strange recollection of how out of tune Wordsworth must have felt with this extraordinary outpouring of creativity that Coleridge was, um, was showing at that time. Imagine being Wordsworth in, <laughs> imagine being Wordsworth, but imagine being Wordsworth in the second half of 1797. Your new friend has just turned up, uh, and he has written what? Well, uh, he's written, you know, the first version of the Ancient Mariner. He's written Cooper Khan. He's written Frost of Midnight. And the Nightingale, it's written the first part of Christabel and the code of Christabel. You must have sat there, you know, with your jaw on the floor at the astonishing, apparently magical, let's say wonderful, productivity of this man who suddenly entered your life. And your own clock-like inability to get going with anything 
actually participate or take part in any of this creativity must have felt what? At least disorientating, perhaps dismay, perhaps even worrying. Does it mean that actually you, you're not, you know, you, don't, you do not have the poetic genius which would justify all sorts of decisions that you've made in your life that presume that you do have something like that poetic genius? Attempts to assimilate the Coleridge fame. I had very little share in the composition of the ancient mariner, so it was of late in life to Frederick Alexander Tyson. For I soon found the style of Coleridge and myself would not assimilate, which is a good phrase. It just wouldn't join up. So even in the, in the, in the thick of his greatest sense of Coleridge's wonder, there's something about his own self perception which is recalcitrant something which won't quite subscribe to what it is that, that, that Coleridge is doing, whatever it is that Coleridge is doing. When, however, he finally returned to poetry, as of course he did, in the spring of 1798, after a good six months away from it, he had of course had learned a lot from the voice, this new voice that was in his head, even though it was a voice that he couldn't entirely uh, subscribe to. Wordsworth said a lot more <coughs> to Isabella Fennec about the attempt to collaborate on the ancient mariner. And let me read you some of it. There's too much to throw on the mariner, so I'll just read it to you. We set off and proceeded along the Pontoc Hills towards Watchet. And in the course of this walk was planned the poem of the ancient mariner, founded on a dream, as Mr. Coleridge has said, of his friend Mr. Crookshank. Much the greatest part of the story was Mr. Coleridge's invention. But certain parts, I myself suggested. For example, some crime was to be committed which would bring upon the old navigator, as Coleridge afterwards delighted to call him, the spectral persecution as a consequence of that crime and his own wanderings. I'd be reading in Sherlock's voyages a day or two before that while doubling Cape Hall, they frequently saw albatrosses in that latitude, the larger sort of sea fowl, some extending their wings 12 or 13 feet. Suppose, said I, you represent him as having killed one of these birds on entering the South Sea, and that the tutelary spirits of these regions take upon them to avenge the crime. The incident was thought fit for the purpose and adopted accordingly. I also suggested the navigation of the ship by the dead men, but do not recollect that I had anything more to do with the scheme of the poem. Well, you may reflect, what else is there to do the scheme of the poem? You've got the albatross, you've got the crier, you've got the dead bed on the ship, and you know, pretty much everything that is a part of the plot is there, isn't it? But Wordsworth clearly isn't meaning to be funny or meaning to be self-deprecating. He's taking for granted what was clearly taken for granted between himself and Coleridge. The whole aspect, a whole crucial central aspect of that poem is not exhausted by this apparently exhaustive account of its plot. So what is that other element that's there? And what might that have done to Wordsworth? Well, there's an important clue, it seems to me, in what Wordsworth does when, once he's writing again in the spring of 1798, he goes back to the first poem he wrote to Coleridge when he turned up a race down in June the following, the previous year. And the first poem he read out uh, at, at that encounter was a new poem, as Dorothy says in the letter to Catherine Clarkson, a new poem called The Ruined Cottage, with which Dorothy reports Coleridge was much delighted. Now that new poem, uh, The Ruined Cottage, uh, is, as you all know, as you all remember, it's the sad story of a woman called Margaret. Her husband's taken off to fight as a soldier and never comes back. She is completely incapacitated by her loss of her husband, but at the same time she's unable to accept in some fundamental way that her husband has been lost. So she's caught in some terrible limbo bereavement where she is at once bereft but unable to breathe. <clears throat> this is the uh, uh, wonderfully um, perceived psychological state that Wordsworth explores in this uh, brilliant, masterful, Unable to accept the finality of Robert's departure, she hangs on to her increasingly derelict cottage. The whole poem is structured around an entirely implicit parallel between the decay of the cottage and the decay of Margaret. And she finally ends her days 
as her poem ends in this way. Yet still she loved this wretched spot, nor would for worlds have parted heavens, and still that length of road and this rude bench on torturing hope endeared, fast rooted at her heart, and stranger, here in sickness she remained, and here she died, last human tenant of the three walls. A lot of Wordsworth's great thinking gets going by placing unexpected emphases upon apparently innocuous words. The uh, apparently innocuous word that receives Wordsworthian emphasis here is the word human. Margaret is the last human tenant. After her, the tenants will be inhuman. They will be uh, nature, they'll be plants, they'll be rodents, they'll be vermin. That's the, that's the metaphorical logic that lies behind the version of the poem we call each other. That is deeply humanitarian, deeply sympathetic, and it must be a wonderful poem to hear. But it won't do in Coleridge's new universe that's just swept into the kitchen door in June 1797, because in Coleridge's universe, the distinction between a human and the non-human yeah, is entirely permeable and malleable. There is no distinction really between the human and the non-human. You're all part of a vast animate and animated, divinely animated creation. So, full of that exciting and inspiring new idea and hope in the spring of 1798, Wordsworth goes back and adds a new end to the ruined cottage. Um, and then rather than lamenting her misfortune, Margaret's misfortune, Wordsworth manages to find uh, in her terrible history, the grounds for hope and even uh, a strange kind of spiritual buoyancy. If you go back and look at the poems, it's published uh, uh, in, in, in modern editions. The person who speaks that, uh, that ending isn't Wordsworth himself, it's a new character, a newly characterized character called the Peddler. Seeing Margaret's story as tragic is, of course, still entirely imaginable, but the new ending of the poem surprises us by springing on us a new ending, which, if we do not read things with what uh, the peddler calls an unworthy eye, if we read them with a worthy eye, we will realize that the optimistic ending to the poem is truer than the uh, tragic and sad ending that uh, Coleridge heard in June 1797. Well, you can see at once, can't you, where Wordsworth is getting all this language of uh, reading uh, nature's appearances from. It's from Coleridge, from things like those lines from Destiny of Nations I quoted a moment ago, in which eyes find within experience a mighty alphabet for infant minds. It's also something I think that uh, Wordsworth has learned from the ancient mariner. For what is, to go back to the point I made a moment ago, what is that crucial thing that Coleridge's poem has? that Wordsworth's synopsis of it does not have? And the answer is the mind of the mariner himself. The mariner is the narrator of his own story, and much of his narration is as much revelatory of his own mind, of his own character, as it is an objective account of what happened in the South Pacific. We all think, if we think of it at all, I suppose, of the ancient mariner as a poem about going on a terrible sea journey doing some terrible thing and getting some terrible um, uh, kickback from the decision that you've made. But actually, uh, The Ancient Mariner is a poem about having an awful time at a wedding reception. It's about you know, coming out of the church, or about to go into the church rather, and being buttoned by someone who won't stop talking about the awful thing that's happened to them. So in other words, it's not about a sea journey, it's about a sea of instruction which features this features the sea journey as, as an exemplary tale. And just so, the revised ruined cottage isn't the story of Margaret, it was the story of Margaret as it's deployed by this new character, the peddler, uh, to instruct um, the, uh, the interlocutor about, about what's going on. So in other words, there's, there's a newly discovered interest, not just in the tale that you're telling, but in the teller who's telling the tale. Uh, and that's one of the things that Wordsworth has learned, I think, from the ancient mariner. Uh, just to peg that a little bit, towards the end of one of the drafts of um, the ruined cottage, um, Wordsworth has these lines. I turned to the old man and said, my friend, your words have consecrated many things, and for the tale which you have told, I think I am a better and a wiser man, which is evidently an 
revolution at the end of the ancient mariner, was that the wedding guests were a, a, a sadder and a wiser man. Sadder, I suppose, because the mariner is a very ambiguous kind of moral instructor. He seems haggard and benighted and the very opposite of illuminated, although I suppose dimly fumbling towards some kind of uh, spiritual recognition. Wordsworth's peddler, on the other hand, is clearly a person of obvious spiritual election. He is a person of tremendous spiritual authority. And so I suppose it's no wonder that having discovered this person who delivered these things with uh, tremendous uh, spiritual authority, Wordsworth then wondered where on earth this person might have come from and how he came to be the impressive way that he was. And it's in pursuing that line of inquiry, which he does in the spring of 1798, that he discovers uh, the whole back history of the pet. Now, those lines are sometimes printed in modern editions as a poem called The Peddler, although they're, they're never a, a free standalone poem in Wordsworth's eyes. Uh, but they're worth reading. And what they show is that the peddler's eminently worthy eye, not an unworthy eye, but a wonderful worthy eye, his worthiness is entirely the result of being a good reader of Coleridge. This is what Wordsworth says about the peddler. Wonder not if such as transports were for in all things he saw one life and felt that it was joy. Which, if you have a Coleridge antennae, is immediately vibrating. Uh, a bit later on, he says of the peddler, he was a chosen son, and, and, and so he goes on. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, a little bit further down there. Um, to every natural fall, rock, fruit, and flower, even the loose stones that cover the highway, he gave a moral life. He saw them feed or link them to some feeling. So there's a slight loosening of Coleridge's uh, quite extreme theological claim. Uh, it's a little bit more about psychology than it is about uh, metaphysics, but it's still the same idea of all of creation being part of some uh, continuous and, uh, and all-encompassing moral life. No distinction between human and non-human here, for example. And as you can see, in everything he looks at, in all shapes, what does the peddler see? He sees a spirit of strange meaning, which is clearly a, a version of the kind of, uh, of platonic uh, initiation that Coleridge has in those poems that uh, he brought into, um, into Wordsworth's uh, uh, kitchen. Very, very nice, as, 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 as Peter says in his article, to protest wonder not, uh, because it introduces the idea of wonder in a positive way, while saying at the same time, don't worry about this as being wonder in a negative way. That's to say, this will seem a wonder to you, this will seem very, very strange to you, but it shouldn't seem strange to you because this sort of visionary experience is only to be expected if you've signed in to call original wisdom. That's the sort of meaning that's, that's going on there. Um, so, what I'm saying is that Wordsworth is using Coleridgean terms here to try and figure out who he is as a writer, as a poet, or who he might be, or who he might have been. Wordsworth says to Isabella Fenwick, the peddler was chiefly an idea of what I fancied my own character might have been. So he's using the Coleridgean language in a very recognizable way to try and sort out his own self-perception, his own self-conception as, as a writer. And one of the indications that must be true is that when he conjures all, all these lines into book three of the 1805 prelude, he, he, he transports the third person account of the peddler to the first person account of Darwin Wordsworth. Wonder not if such my transports were, for in all things I saw one life and felt in the Now, they're not Wordsworth's greatest sort of biographical lines as they stand in the prelude, uh, and much greater experiments are shortly to follow. But it seems to me deeply indicative that he gets there, even through the strange displaced route of the third person, uh, by responding to Coleridgean <coughs> ideas and, and Coleridgean language. And when he writes his really great autobiographical verse, which I'm coming on to in a second, it will be when he finds the uh, Coleridgean uh, role model, uh, the wonderful role model that Coleridge sets up, much more difficult uh, to fulfill. Well, there's a lot more you can say about Wordsworth and the Ancient Mariner. Um, many readers have recognized Peter Bell, of course, as a kind of reimagined version of the Ancient Mariner in which Cruelty to animals plays a symbolic role as uh, a mark of spiritual inadequacy. More interestingly, it seems to me, you can see the lovely passage in the prelude 
in which Wordsworth, the boy Wordsworth, steals a shepherd's boat. Do you remember this episode? And rows out into nighttime Ullswater, uh, a Cumbrian recasting of the ancient mariner. What does the mariner's ship do in, in the ancient mariner? It, it transgresses in some way by going into unspoiled and silent spaces where it's never been before. And the whole story of the ancient mariner pivots upon uh, the mariner's self-conviction that he's committed a crime. We have no other authority in the poem for the fact that shooting the albatross was a crime at all, apart from the mariner's own conviction that it was a crime. And after that crime, in his own eyes, the mariner, of course, is persecuted in a spectral way. Well, think about that as a structure, and think about the episode of the boat stealing in, in the prelude. The boy Wordsworth sets off in the shepherd's boat He's guilty, he's guilty of theft because he's taken the boat and he knows he's guilty. He rows off out into the silence of the nighttime lake. And then suddenly he's terrified by the, by the mountains rising up and apparently chasing him, looming after him. And thereafter the mountains take the form of a nightmare, which is to say, I suppose, a kind of spectral persecution. Huge and mighty forms, he says, that do not live like living men. Well, that's strong ancient mariner issue, isn't it? That do not live like living men, move slowly through my mind by day, and were the trouble of my dreams. Brilliance and the greatness and the wonderfulness in an entirely positive way of Wordsworth's uh, episode is that it occurs wholly within the parameters of childhood experience, but its feeling, it seems to me, is deeply informed by the ancient mariner that Wordsworth has clearly read and deeply absorbed, as J.C. Maxwell first pointed out there is an illusion which pins the two together, which implies that this isn't just my own fantasy. Wordsworth says it was an act of stealth and trouble and pleasure, not without the voice of his fantastic double negatives, and Wordsworth, which I can talk about tedious length, by the way, not without the voice of mountain echoes did my boat move on, leaving behind her still on either side small circles glittering widely in the moon, until they melted all into one trap of sparkling. Why does he go into such detail about the visual effects of rowing through the lake? Effects that seem gratuitous in a sense to the point of the story he's telling. And the reason is he wants to capture a Coleridgean illusion. Beyond the shadow of the ship, I watched the water stains. They moved in tracks of shining white. And when they rear the aftershine for the water, it will be so, so it's that kind of nighttime phantasmagoric um, Coleridgean universe that he wants somehow to bring into the domestic space of, of, a, of a boyhood uh, episode in Holsworth. Wordsworth has done what he always does with Coleridge, which is to say he's shed the, the Gothic from him, but he's kept some of the quality and the contours of the Gothic, but now re-understood within the terms of childhood psychology. It, it's a brilliant and, and uh, remarkable effect. But what I want to end by saying is not about the ancient mariner, what I want to end by saying is something about Frost at Midnight. Because I think it's Frost at Midnight that is of all the poems that Wordsworth must have watched, astonished, coming from the Coleridge factory. It's Frost at Midnight that was the poem that mattered most to him as he began the verse that would sometime later find itself worked into the prelude. If I've got a thesis to put forward this evening, and I'm not sure I have, but if I do have a thesis to put forward this evening, it is that Wordsworth did not know quite what to make. I know what to make of Coleridge. And in that formative uncertainty or ambiguity lay everything that was most important about Coleridge to Wordsworth. If he'd got the tabs on Coleridge, then there wouldn't be any influence that mattered. Or if he projected Coleridge, there wouldn't be any influence that mattered either. What really matters is he didn't quite know uh, uh, what Coleridge meant to him. Um, and it's in the autobiographical fragments written in the autumn of 1798, so the other end of the great the Great Summer after Tintin Abbey, later he worked to become uh, the two-book prelude, that it seems to me you can see the way that the wonder of Coleridge is both embraced as an inspiration, but also placed at a certain distance as Wordsworth discovers what's going to become his great mature adult voice. He couldn't have got there without Coleridge, but the voice that he gets to isn't, in the end, Coleridge. So what's the context of these lines, these lines that become the prelude? Well, the context is simply this, as I'm sure you all know. Coleridge is, is expecting Wordsworth to write philosophically. He's expecting Wordsworth to write verse, blank verse, 
but it's going to put forward philosophical ideas. Philosophical ideas of which Coleridge himself will approve. Philosophical ideas, uh, of course, that uh, would um, uh, tune in to all those sorts of things that Coleridge has been saying to uh, Wordsworth in race time. What's striking is, uh, when he sits down to write, this is a very familiar story, and I'm sure you all know it, when Wordsworth sits down to write, he doesn't find himself writing philosophically, he finds himself writing autobiographically. And as he writes autobiographically, the main text is in his mind. The model isn't St. Augustine, it's not Rousseau, it's not anything like that, it's Frosted Was it for this, says Wordsworth, that one of the fairest of all rivers loved to blend his murmurs with my nurse's song? from his altar shades and rocky falls, and from his falls and shadows, sent a voice to intertwine my dreams. For this did star O Derwent, traveling over the green plains near my sweet birthplace, did star beauteous stream give ceaseless music to the night and day, which with its steady cadence, tempering our human waywardness, composed my thoughts to more than infant softness, giving me among the fretful tenements of man the knowledge of dim earnest of the car which nature breathes among her little haunts. Well, the clue that Wordsworth manifestly has across the midnight in mind is Sweet Birthplace, when he rework, reworks these lines into the first book of the two part prelude, Sweet Birthplace Gains, inverted commas. And what he's thinking about is this passage from Frost of Midnight. How often in my early schoolboy days, with most believing superstitious wish for sageful, have I gazed upon the vast, to watch the stranger there. And oft the night with unclosed lids already had I dreamt of my sweet birthplace and the old church tower. And so it goes on, a very beautiful passage. Um, the passage I want to concentrate on comes a little bit later in Frost Midnight, however. Frost of Midnight, like the peddler, like the ancient mariner, is an education poem. It doesn't feature a scene of instruction, but it thematizes education in two ways. There's bad education, which is what you get at school, and there's good education, which is what you get if you wander around a kind of mythologized or fictionalized version of the Lake District, and hear God speaking to you, or read, rather, read God speaking to you through the landscape. And it's the second kind of positive education that Coleridge imagines in a very fond and tender way for his boy, and it's the first and desperate and awful kind of sterile education that he, of course, himself has endured. This is what he imagines of his little boy. Dear babe, that sleep is cradled by my side, whose gentle breathings heard in this dead calm fill up the interspersed vacancies and momentary pauses of the thought. My babe so beautiful, that fills my heart with tender gladness thus to look at thee, and think that thou shalt learn far other lore and in far other scenes. For I was reared in the great city, pent with cloisters dim, and saw more lovely than the sky and stars. But thou, my babe, shalt wander like a breeze by lakes and sandy shores, beneath the crags of ancient mountain, and beneath the clouds which image in their bulk both lakes and shores and mountain crags. So shalt thou see and hear the lovely shapes and sounds intelligible of that eternal language which thy God utters, who from eternity doth teach himself in all, and in all things in himself. This is a very, very striking passage. Jonathan Wordsworth, my old tutor, used to say this is the first description of Wordsworth's childhood in poetry. And of course it comes in a Coleridge poem. Um, Jonathan was exaggerating, because you can go back to early bits of Wordsworth's juvenilia. Uh, but you can still see the point he's making. It's a very, very striking piece of comfort and landscape poetry uh, from a man, of course, who's there been north of, um, what, Gloucester, Birmingham, something like that at this stage in his life. Um, lovely shapes and sounds intelligible in that eternal language. Think about the two crucial um, organizing uh, tropes that are running through this passage. One is a language of breezes, uh, nurturing and encouraging and coaxing breezes. And one is an idea of an alphabet or a language which nature represents. Those are the two big ideas that, that Coleridge has taken over from his rather kind of rebarbative, abstract philosophical verse in the mid 1790s and conjured into this beautiful poetry of paternal, of paternal benediction. And it's one of the most wonderful examples of how abstraction can turn itself into uh, a beautiful, personal, and intimate poetry. 
Um, when Wordsworth sits down and finds himself writing those lines with Coleridge in mind, what he writes strikingly is this, and, and what I'm arguing today is that he has Frost at Midnight specifically in mind. The sweet birthplace thing is the clue, and I think that with sweet birthplace, you can go on then to say that a few minutes later, he's writing these lines, scribbled in his notebook, or rather in Dorothy's notebook, in the autumn of 1798, with Frost at Midnight especially in mind. For this in springtime, when on southern banks the shining sun had from his knot of leaves decoyed the primrose flower, and when the vales and woods were warm, was I a rover then in the high places on the lonely peaks among the mountains and the winds. Though mean and though glorious were my views, because he's gone out to smash ravens' eggs being paid by shepherds, the end was not ignoble. Oh, when I have hung above the raven's nest, have hung alone by half-inch fissures in the slippery rock but ill-sustained, almost as it seemed suspended by the blast which blew a mane against the naked crag. Ah, then, while on the perilous ridge I hung alone, with what strange utterance to the loud dry wind blow through my ears. The sky seemed not a sky of earth, and with what motion moved the clouds. Amazing, that verse, astonishing, that verse, which seems to have come very, very quickly. Uh, completely the mature, the great, the greatest uh, Wordsworth of the prelude. And part of their greatness and part of the surprise that they must have been to Wordsworth himself, it seems to me, is that they are nothing like those lines that describe the breezy, gentle childhood of Hartley in Frost of Midnight. Frost of Midnight, we have an articulate language which, which Hartley can read uh, from the landscape. We have a gentle coaxing and nurturing breeze that will, that will blow him along, so that even he becomes like a breeze himself. Uh, it, it, it is absolutely a, a language of, and, a, and a sentiment of, of, of gentleness and legibility. Uh, your experience is gentle and coaxed, uh, and what you can do is look at the landscape and read it. What we get here is the opposite of all that, isn't it? What we get here is the blast, we get cold, cumbering winds, not soft Somerset winds or Dorsetshire winds. And instead of getting a legible alphabet that we can read, we get something much more interesting, don't we? We get a strange utterance. Which is to say, I suppose, something speaking in a foreign language that we can't understand. So where Coleridge bursts into Coleridge and into Wordsworth's life with this with this wonderful uh, I use the word purposefully, this wonderful sense of the legibility of things, if enlightened by a certain spirituality. What Wordsworth is responding to here in a kind of reactive way, in a kind of denying way, is precisely that idea of, of the translucence or the legibility or, or the readability of experience. What Wordsworth is interested in here is the fact that certain kinds of experience stay with you and lurk with you because you can't get to the bottom of them. And that's where this moment of resistance to the thing that he found wonderful in Coleridge begins to express itself. These lines themselves are, to use his phrase, a strange utterance, aren't they? They, they exploit all sorts of um, expectations that we have in English verse in a way which thwarts <coughs> or frustrates them. So when the sentence begins, oh, when I have hung above the raven's nest, we expect something like a narrative climax. And it feels, as you go through that long and very brilliantly articulated, syntactically articulated sentence, it feels as though we are heading towards something like, perhaps a gothic denouement of that sentence. But we don't get that. What we get actually is a reiteration of what we started with. When I've hung above the raven's nest, ah, uh, then when on the perilous bridge I hung alone, with what strange utterance the loud dry wind go through my ears. And then in the last line and a half, one of the most audacious experiments that Wordsworth ever commits in the art of tautology. The sky seemed not a sky of earth, and with what motion moved the clouds. If you wrote with what motion moved the clouds in a creative writing class, I bet the professor would cross out with what motion moved because it is inelegant and inexpressive. 
But of course here it's extraordinarily expressive because Wordsworth is creating within the drama of his own vocabulary choice this, this sense of language being absolutely up against the limits of what's expressible, uh, the very, very limits of comprehensibility. So if part of the wonder of Coleridge, as I've been saying earlier on in this talk, was that he breathed into Wordsworth's life with a sense of this extraordinary lucidity uh, that might come with his religious vision, that everything might be bathed in a strong and illuminating bright light of divine purpose. When Wordsworth really discovers his own voice, what he discovers is something antithetical to that, which is that there isn't a sense of bright and illuminating purpose, not enlightenment in a sense at all, but something different, something which is strange, and in a way, perplexing. Uh, Coleridge once said in the privacy of his notebook, uh, ruefully, a grievous fault it is, he said, my illustrations swallow up my thesis. My illustrations swallow up my thesis. And my th sense is that that's what happens too, brilliantly, when Wordsworth seems to write his autobiographical lines informed by Coleridge's philosophy. He knows what the thesis is. The thesis is Coleridge's thesis, which is the thesis expressed in Destiny of Nations and elsewhere. But the illustrations that Wordsworth brings up, because he's auto writing autobiographically, to bear out that thesis, turn out to swallow it up or to thwart it, or to complicate it, or to gainsay it. Um, the philosophical verse, as I say, is meant to be broadly speaking Coleridgean. It's kind of going to head under a sort of Coleridgean commission. But the things that Wordsworth draws from his own childhood experience seem anything but the kinds of experience that uh, Coleridge imagines for his little boy at the end of Frost and Midnight. Uh, and Wordsworth knows that. Wordsworth is profoundly self-acquainted person and knows exactly what's going on. And when he turns these lines into the two-part prelude, there's a passage which I think we should hear as being directed explicitly to Coleridge and addressing this point. I believe, that is to say, Coleridge, you and I believe, that there are spirits which when they would form a favoured being from his very dawn of infancy to open out the clouds at the touch of lightning, seeking it with gentle visitation, so like that the, the, the passage across the, across the middle of the bridge. Quiet powers, retired and seldom recognized, yet kind, and to the very meanest not unknown. With me, this is wonderfully concessive, though rarely, in my boyish days, they communed. And suddenly, here's this complete shot across the bowels of Congress' entire worldview. Well, others, too, there are, who use, yet happily aiming at the self same end, severer interventions, ministry, which is the world, of course, it appears in the first line of Frost and Midnight, but now twisted to a different purpose. Ministry more palpable of their school as I. I think we need to understand those lines to be directly addressed to Coleridge. And what they're saying is something like this. I understand what you're saying. I've got the theory. I understand the metaphysics, even. And I know the wonderful poetry you wrote in Frost and Midnight about gentle visitations. But look at the stuff I found when I actually went looking. Uh, I found childhood memories about transgression and trauma and unhappiness uh, and being lost and being isolated and being desolate. Uh, but still, uh, we are happily on the same wavelength, aren't we? That's what that passage is saying. Uh, happily aiming at the self same end. But I don't think they were on the same wavelength. And I think Wordsworth's recognition of that, that they weren't, in the end of the autumn of 1798 was the making of 